well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's so good to see you all this beautiful Monday morning. Uh, hi there, Stephen. Hi, Luke, Tom, B, Jesse, uh, Bryce, Faith, Glenn. Uh, it is so good to see you all this morning. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, David, too, uh, for joining us for de daily devotions through Redeeming Life Fellowship. And uh, today, as we're following along with the Revive School reading plan, we're going to be jumping into uh, uh, a new section, as it were, of, of Matthew's Gospel, where over the next four days, we're going to be dealing with a lot of miracles uh, for, let's see here, yeah, oh, next one, two, three, four days, we're going to be going through through Matthew chapters 8 and 9, which together uh, contain uh, half of all of Matthew's uh, miracle accounts. So uh, this it's like this uh, dense, concentrated section where, where Matthew is opening the window for us, the audience, to see more closely the significance of, of Jesus's, not just Jesus's uh, words in his teaching, but the significance of Jesus's work in his miracles. And something you might say, if you're trying to, to, to grasp what it is that is the purpose behind recording all of these miracles. Well, there's lots of purposes, but one that I want to propose to all of us is that when that when we see Matthew recording so much with regards to Jesus's teaching and his miracles, his word and his works, that those together do serve to demonstrate to us uh, certainly who Jesus is, but for us to, 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 for our eyes to be opened and to see the measure or the quality of, of Jesus's authority as the son of God, as a son of man, as the Messiah, as indeed that, that, that we can, in other words, that when we look at the person of Jesus described in the gospels, that that we receive his words and behold his works in a way that recognizes that that a person who says these things and a person who does these things uh wields a uh, real authority not the authority that's derivative of some kind of human office or of one that's of some kind of dominating power that says obey me or else but rather that that Jesus's authority is one that is um, self-evident, intrinsic, innate, uh, one that that is not uh, derivative of somebody else who's higher than him, uh, and that that if Jesus really does have that kind of authority, we might ask ourselves as 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 people as human beings uh who who have in the words of a, a book i've just been reading uh like all humans uh uh people with feet of clay hearts of stone and brains of mush uh how do we respond to somebody who like jesus who has the kind of the the uh, unquestioned authority that 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 he actually has and uh, and the good thing also, I, I'll just remark in passing, is that that maybe sometimes or oftentimes when we think about uh, about uh, authority and people being under authority, that we're not thinking about those relationships in terms of ones that are connected by love. Uh, in other words, uh, as uh, my academic dean, Don Fairbairn, would say, uh, that we oftentimes think about love in terms of equals and that by the time that we're talking about authority and submission to authority that uh, we're not thinking about the the nature of that relationship in love and that's not the case and we should know that to not be the case principally in the way we think about um the relationship of say like an authority of a parent over over a child and that you can have um uh, uh authority that's over a child that 
um, that is characterized and energized and sustained by loving affection and responsibility and care for that person. In that, without that kind of understanding of, of authority, you would never have a, a, a fruitful relationship and indeed uh, um, the capacity for a child to grow and to flourish in a way that it, that it should without this understanding of authority or responsibility as someone who's above him. And for us, I believe that that's the sort of thing that perhaps we oftentimes lose when we don't think about God's authority over us and our responsibility towards him. Namely, one that says uh, that, that, that Jesus so um, aptly summed up when he's speaking to his disciples where he says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And that, that love and obedience are not antithetical. They are indeed complementary and necessary if we're going to, to be walking in right relationship with God. And so I would submit to you that this bigger picture of, of the way in which uh, Matthew demonstrates the self-evident and natural authority of Jesus demonstrated through his works and his words our testimony to us about who Jesus is and what our relationship to him should be. But that is a whole nother digression that you did not sign up for, but you listened through it anyway. So gold star for you. You can toot your own horn. So, uh, but with that in mind, uh, what we're about to read today, uh, the reading plan leads us through chapter 8, verses 1 through 21, but we're really going to be focusing on verses 5 through 13, a passage that is oftentimes described as the faith of the centurion. And I, I admit, it's as it is in the case of so many miracle stories, it's a little bit harder to get to the end of it and find out what is the point. That's a problem with a lot of biblical narrative, where these are not like Aesop's fables, where uh, you get to the end of it, and then uh, somebody, some scribe writes in the end, and the moral of the story is, you should do this, or you should not do that. Uh, where it's it's not always immediately evident why it is that, that, um, that Matthew not only records the things that he does, but records them in the way that he does. And so... Uh, and it's, it's, one could say that in a passage like this, that we should be in awe and amazed at the power of Jesus' words and the power that they have to heal. And, but what's interesting about this is that, uh, unlike so many, uh, of the miracles where the focus is principally on the, 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 the problem person, problem child, problem nature, where there is this shift forwards and backwards, not just to the, the, the centurion, but also to Jesus. Um, and, and his remarks about this person who's come to him for help. And so uh, it's, it's, it, it is a balance to what, to this, this miracle account. And what I would propose to you that that of there's there's lots of things to pull out of a passage like the one that we're about to read, but there's one bigger thing at issue that, that's 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 at hand that I think Matthew is wanting us to catch, and let me try and explaining it in, in this way. Have you heard the idiomatic expression? the canary in the coal mine. Uh, it's borrowed from, I guess, like our our American history, maybe even uh, trans-American history, of, of coal miners who uh, descend uh, down this mine shaft deep into a heart and, and uh, extract coal as a natural resource for heat and et cetera, et cetera. And that one of the things that uh, fairly, I, I presume actually fairly early in the technological developments of 
coal mining, if you could speak to them in that way, it was the, the practice of catching a canary, putting it in a cage, and taking that canary down into the coal mines with you. So why, why bring a caged bird down into, into the, uh, you know, this coal mine? It's not like the canary is going to help you or that uh, they're lonesome or that they're just doing it for music, that they're hoping this bird will sing to them, but rather that the canary was used for, for, for sensing gas, where in the process of mining, the, uh, and say you hit a gas pocket or a gas leak, when that starts leaking, the first thing that it's going to affect is the canary, when the canary dies. And so if, as you're working, you're swinging your pickaxes and trying to get coals out, um, you look at the, the, the bird cage and you find out if there's a dead canary in there, it's time to get out because uh, if you don't get out soon, you're all gonna be canaries in this great big coal mine. And so the way that that turned to be this kind of this idiomatic expression is that um, where there's something that, that, um, that is the, the first thing to happen and that when it does happen, in a matter of time, uh, those effects um, in the beginning are going to be widespread and multiplied if it keeps going on in, uh, uh, without any, any kind of change. So it's like uh, what you're seeing is a microcosm of something larger than it is that you're going to expect. And so what I would submit to you is that in this passage, even while Matthew is showing us this profound miracle and one that is the, uh, that reflects so much grace on Jesus's part is something like a canary in the coal mine where what Matthew sees happening in this, this profound moment is one that uh, is this microcosm or this first thing that, um, is going to to sort of uh, uh, it's emblematic of a wider, more profound, even scandalous to some phenomenon that's about that that's going to happen through the ministry and the work of Jesus. What's happening here is going to be the first among many that's that that Jesus anticipates that is going to happen through this. So let's let's read this together. Uh, this is Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Let's pause here for a second. Most translations will read, Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. What's interesting about this is that the, the translation, most of those translations, when it says, I will go and heal him, uh, do not take into account what is a peculiar way of speaking for Matthew that, in, in technical terms, he's supplying uh, an additional uh, personal pronoun that seems to be redundant, and it's not why, or it's not immediately clear why it is that he's adding it. And... Uh, a good many scholars, and I agree with them now, that um, say that the, by virtue of adding this extra pronoun is one that is to shift this, this statement of Jesus not as a, res, uh, um, a response to his command to go heal him or a request to heal him. That's implicit in what the centurion says. But rather, it's framed in the form of a question. You want... Uh, uh, um, you want me to come and heal him, as it would be, even though that there's no interrogative pronoun uh, uh, that's 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 in the original Greek. It seems to me that that is actually a better translation than Jesus just saying, "I will go and heal him," because with the if Jesus is asking, "You want me to go heal him." 
is one that is certainly more consistent with something that is self-evident within the ancient world but goes without being said for for us is that Jews do not associate and certainly do not fraternize with Gentiles in that uh, for Jesus, a Jewish miracle worker, to go to a centurion's house to come under his roof is beyond the pale of respect. Uh, that that is something that no um, sound-thinking, pious Jew of the first century would ever do. So what's what's happening here as this drama unfolds and this engage this this dialogue unfolds is one where. The centurion recognizes that, that based upon that type of custom, that there is a million miles of separation between somebody like, like the centurion and somebody like Jesus, and that it would be, that it would be unthinkable for for Jesus to come to his house to heal to heal this this person, uh, to this the servant of the centurion, and uh, so. In my opinion, that what Jesus is saying there is actually better phrased as a question. You want me to go heal him? Uh, and verse 8, the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. So it should not be lost on us that, that a, a decorated uh, official like a centurion in Capernaum, a person who, whose life um, moves, lives, and breathes, uh, breathes uh, uh, um, in response to this stratified hierarchy of Roman officials, where uh, you know your place and you know your power by relationships of authority, and uh, and that uh, you're well aware uh, who it is that you have of authority over, and you also are well aware of the the, the person to whom you have a re uh, responsibility towards. And uh, so for, for the centurion, he knows authority when he sees it, and he sees it in Jesus. And uh, to be sure, this is another example similar to the message in uh, Matthew chapter 2 about the visit of the Magi, where uh, these Magi, these people, these outsiders are coming and recognizing, where is the person born king of the Jews? That... Uh, it took somebody from the outside to come in to recognize the very thing that was under their noses, which demonstrates to us, the readers, the way in which the ministry of Jesus is taking the way that we understand kingship and authority and power um, uh, and, and the kingdom, the, the kingdoms of the world, that the kingdom of heaven, when it comes, is turning all of it on its head. And even something like that is happening right here where a centurion um, recognizes the own limitations of his own authority and that he has just about as much authority to command Jesus to come heal as he would probably have the authority to go to Caesar's court and command him to do the hokey pokey. It's not going to happen. But, uh, so he recognizes it. And, uh, and then... Let's, uh, let's finish up here. It says, verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he was astonished. And it's a remarkable thing that uh, thaumatso, the, the verb to be astonished, Matthew uses it a lot, but it's always with people who are on the outside, they're amazed at Jesus's work and his ministry and his power and his teaching. This is the only time where Jesus himself is amazed. Uh, maybe you would think of it uh, just as an example, like uh, uh, where if you've ever watched 
um, uh, the magicians, Penn and Teller, uh, long-standing musicians, decades of, of doing magic shows. Uh, they, after doing it for so long, they have this television show called Fool Us, where they'll invite um, invite uh, uh, other aspiring magicians to come and perform for them and try and fool fool the magicians with their own magic tricks. And part of the fun in all of this is where not that you just get to see these magicians performing their tricks, but you get to see the 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 masters of it. And that when they're amazed and they can't figure out how it is that they do it, it's all crazy and amazing because uh, the, the the people who are accustomed to amazing others are themselves amazed at what's happening. And so the fact that, that what Jesus hears in this thing, he says, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. It's, it, if there's something that should come as a shock to us is that we're not shocked or amazed at what amazes Jesus. If Jesus is amazed by this, then that should give us some pause. But I digress. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished. He was amazed and said to those following him, I tell you the truth. I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. High praise for a centurion, isn't it? And this is the sort of faith where where he, with the best of what the, the, the centurion knows, is not only that Jesus has power, but he has authority, and he submitted to it. And, um, and done so in such a profound fashion that he knows that, that um, he is a man who has to yield to his words that carry authority. And... Up until that point, he says, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Uh, that should give all of us, the readers, pause. And it says this, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The heavenly uh, banquet, as it's sometimes called, where... Uh, at the end of all things, where, where the consummation of the heavenly kingdom is really made manifest. It is heaven on earth because God himself is in charge. And it's the time for celebration. And who is going to be there celebrating with the, the, the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? It's going to be someone like this centurion. Someone who, in this present day, are, are miles apart uh, where you're not even allowed to 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 come under uh, this person's roof are going to be sharing at the same table. This bespeaks to how profound of a change that it's going to be when when the work of of God's heavenly kingdom is finally complete and that again we have this, canary in the coal mine. Uh, this, this first thing that's happened, this profound phenomenon that gives us this foretaste that is this harbinger of something that, that nobody is prepared to anticipate, uh, that just blows your expectations. And it says this, uh, but the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, uh, like we talked about earlier in, in Revelation, and indeed in the prophets, whenever we're talking about the day of the Lord, and the es uh, of a, in eschatology, the anticipation of what that day of the Lord is going to be like, there's salvation and there's judgment. Uh, Matthew captures this just as well as any, any other biblical author. And lastly, he says this, then Jesus said to the centurion, go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. So to be sure, what it is that's happened here in this passage gives us a foretaste of, of what the, the future indeed is to be like, but it's also instructive or corrective. Where for one, that it is easy 
like so many people, so many Jews who might have been reading Matthew's gospel, to let the security of their salvation and their identity as the children of God be resting on something apart from faith in Christ. Namely, their religious heritage, their belonging to the right group, their belonging to the right class, that um, that they that their in the long run, that their salvation was resting principally on race and not grace. And uh, that sh should, I think, also be the sort of thing that that challenges and and pokes sharply at our self-righteous hearts that look to anything, whether it's our, our, our actions or our heritage or our genetics or um, our talent or, um, or the things that we look to that, that make us feel as though that we are something beautiful and wonderful in God's eyes. But here's the centurion who recognizes that Jesus has authority and that as a centurion, Jesus doesn't owe him anything. Uh, and that Jesus has author an authority that is superior to his. Um, and all he does is come to him and ask for help uh, because he knows that he needs him. And so uh, it's probably, I think, fair to say that when you see somebody like the centurion, you see somebody who um, exhibits the qualities of somebody like described in the Beatitude, who's, who is meek, who is pure, or who is, who is um, poor in spirit, uh, who is you know, mourning, afraid, but recognizes his need for Jesus. And if, if that's what's at the core of this healing narrative, uh, that should tell us something about how it is that our hearts and our attitudes should be uh, before God. Uh, one that, that, um, that recognizes, that, that, is, that, that is humble before God, that recognizes his authority as Lord, um, and that also recognizes that, 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 um, that it's through Jesus that this hostility that we, we, we experience between God and ourselves and our alienation with him is going to be dealt with. And, um, and that 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 the problem of distance and separation is one that is going to be fixed and accomplished by the power of Jesus's word and his works because of who he is. And uh, I pray that, that each of us, that we uh, would look at somebody like the centurion and his level of faith and his trust uh, was so great, so real indeed, um, so strong and so profound uh, that 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 he could recognize his <laughs> the own poverty of his spirit and the own poverty of his own authority and see his need for God's grace. So uh, let's uh, ponder on that. Uh, ponder on the thing that made Jesus so amazed. Uh, as uh, uh, where where uh, who for a centurion who could recognize the authority of Jesus's words and, and because of who he was. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I hope that you continue to uh, ponder and reflect on the rest of Jesus's miracles uh, throughout these next few days. And I also pray that God would, would bless you, would keep you, would sharpen you, um, would uh, quicken your spirits and make you alive in him uh, so that we can uh, live and walk and and, and um, be the people of God, do the things that Jesus commanded us to do, uh, and continue to put him first in all we say and do. So God love you. Uh, take care, and I'll see you next time.